Good evening, friends. It's Friday once again, and I'm back with another tale from my collection. Now it's time to grab a snack, dim the lights, and let me take you into the night with a story I call Fugue. Peter turned the ignition to start the car. Looking to the front door, he waved to his wife and eased the car from the driveway. His home was not large, but it was comfortable, and he was reluctant to leave it to take his mother-in-law home. It was the least he could do, though, since she had been nice enough to take care of the kids while he and his wife had a night out. Since the children were born, they rarely spent time alone anymore, and he was eager to be alone with her while they slept. It was just before dawn, and to save time, he took a shortcut through an unfamiliar area which made him uncomfortable. Cutting across one block through the alley, the still lingering night was lit up by the flashing lights of police cars blocking the way ahead. Just my luck, he thought as he realized he had inadvertently strayed into a cordoned area. Pulling from the alley, an officer stopped him and shone his flashlight into the car to check out the interior. He let him know that they were searching for a fugitive and gave him a brief description of the wanted man along with a request for them to call if they saw the man. Peter agreed to call and waited for the officer to open the barricade so they could continue. Shortly after leaving the search area, he spotted the suspect on a bicycle and nudged him off the road with the car. Getting out to detain the man, he asked if he had hit his head when he fell. The suspect said, No, I'm fine, and started to climb back onto his bicycle. Peter grabbed him by the shoulder roughly and slammed him onto his back upon the pavement. Now you did he said, looking at the unconscious suspect with a grin. Looking around, Peter saw they were near a park with a restroom and tool shed complex, but he could not see any street signs. He figured the police should be able to locate him from a description of the area, so he called them on his cellular phone to report he was holding their man. While waiting for the police, Peter called his wife to let her know what was happening when the suspect came to and started to get up. Just lay still, buddy. The cops are on the way he said and handed the phone to his mother-in-law. Who do you think you are, mister? The man was now on his feet and looking for a fight. I'll beat you for this. Suddenly, Peter saw a bright flash as the man's fist connected with his nose. His eyes began to tear and before he could regain his senses he felt another blow against the side of his head which drove him to his knees. I'll teach you to mess with me, the man yelled as he kicked Peter hard in the ribs. Peter collapsed flat onto his stomach. He was a pretty good fighter, but this guy wasn't letting him regain his senses long enough to defend himself. Reaching out to push himself up, his hand came to rest on a short piece of pipe, and he knew it could be his saving grace. As the man came at him once more, he swung the pipe wildly and felt it connect. The meeting of pipe and man resulted in a thickly wet thud, followed immediately by the sound of a man hitting the ground. Peter wiped his eyes and strained to look at the man, who was now laying quietly beside him. "'Hey, buddy, you all right?' the cop asked as he walked up. "'I saw the whole thing.' Peter took a hand offered by the cop and got to his feet. He started to say he was fine when a bright light lit up his face, making his eyes tear again. He turned away from it, barely conscious that a reporter was asking him questions. Leaning against the front of his car, Peter became aware he really needed to relieve himself and headed for the restroom in the park. Stumbling across the grass slowly, he could hear the reporter saying something about a hero and the cop called to him. Hey buddy, hang on, I got an ambulance on the way, the cop started after him. I'll be back in a minute, he said quietly, waving the cop off. I gotta take a leak. Walking into the restroom, Peter looked back at his car and saw his wife standing there now. Obviously, his mother-in-law had told her what was happening and she had come to see. He wondered where the kids were and who was watching them. The public toilet smelled nasty, making him fight to keep from retching as he stood over the hole to relieve himself. His head was pounding and he found it hard to focus his eyes. Using the restroom made him feel somewhat better, but as he was zipping up his fly, Peter had a sudden pain in his head and a white flash filled his eyes, making him fall to the floor. When the pain subsided, 
He pulled himself to his feet along the handicapped rail and made his way outside. The sun had come up fully now and he looked toward his car for help but no one was there. He searched the adjoining parking lot, shielding his eyes from the sun only to find there were no vehicles there, not even his own. Where had everyone gone? Still suffering from the beating, he reached for his cell phone to call his wife. It was not in his pocket, and he remembered handing it to his mother-in-law. Looking around, Peter decides he must walk home, or at least get to some place with a phone to call his wife. The neighborhood is unfamiliar, but he remembers the direction he came from and starts walking. Unable to believe he's been deserted by not only the cops and reporter, but his wife as well, he intends to give her a piece of his mind when he finally gets home. A short time later, he sees a small post office facility with a phone booth on the wall outside and is relieved. Finally, he can call his wife to come get him. The coins make a metal clinking sound as he drops him in and he dials the number. The number you have dialed is not in service at this time. If you feel you have made an error, please try your call again. He looks at the phone as if it had lost its mind and dialed again only to have the same message played. Now what? He walked into the post office, glad to be out of the glare of the sun, and headed up to the counter to ask for a map. You look like you feel pretty good today, the postman said. Peter thought for a moment. The pain in his head was now only a dull ache. I feel better than I have for a long time, he says and braces himself on the counter. Can I get a city map, please? Well, that's great, the postal employee smiles and hands him a phone book open to the map. I won't hold all the things you said and did this past year against you because I know you had something wrong in your head. Peter doesn't even register the man's comments as he looks at the map. He's surprised that he cannot find his home street there. I must be a little out of it, Peter says, pointing to the map. Could you help me find Academy Boulevard on this map? Academy Boulevard? The postman seems truly confused. Never heard of it. Never heard of it? It's only the first main road to ever be established on this side of town. Peter's dumbfounded. No wonder postal employees have such a bad reputation. Say, mister, just what town do you think you're in? The man backs up from the counter a bit. What do you mean, what town? Colorado Springs, of course. Where do you think you are, pal? Bumfucked Egypt? Peter glares at the man. Atlantic City, the postman says. You really have been out of it, haven't you? What did you mean the past year, he inquires. Confusion has set in and his head is starting to hurt again. You've been coming in and out of here for a year now, and you've been rude most every time, especially when you have to wait in line. I'm sorry, I don't know what you're talking about, but I apologize if I was rude, Peter says and walks out of the post office. Outside, he's more confused. If he has been gone from home for a year, where does he live? How has he survived? What about his wife and kids? Fear at the thought of losing his wife sets in and he runs to the phone to try to call her again. This time, though, he enters the area code and it was relieved to hear it ringing. Hello? A pleasant woman's voice answers. Peter is relieved. He has finally found his wife. Trisha, baby, it's me. Are you there? Peter! She exclaims happily. I was wondering when you'd finally get a chance to call home. The kids miss you terribly, but I miss you the most. I can't sleep when you're not here. Peter is confused. Trish? Honey? What's going on? What do you mean you wondered when I would get a chance to call? I just walked out of the restroom at the park after the accident when I was taking your mother home and you were gone. Everyone was gone. Oh, Peter, it's okay. How does your head feel? She seemed totally unconcerned. It hurts, and I keep getting these white flashes. He leaned against the wall. The doctor said that this might happen and you wouldn't remember. It's okay, Peter, she reassured him. Just get on the plane and come home now. I will explain everything. Peter is confused, but he has no reason to doubt his wife. Okay, uh, I'll get there as fast as I can. 
They talk for a few more minutes as she gets on the computer and arranges him a flight home. He's still clearly confused, but knows the answers he needs are at home with his wife. Why wouldn't they be? Everything he's ever needed was there at home with his wife. Peter settled back into the seat and waited for the airplane to take off. In just a few hours, he'll be back home. What happened to him? Where has he been and what's he been doing for the past year? There is a really deep feeling of loss as he realized he has totally lost a year of his life and has no idea about it. The plane rolls down the runway and lifts into a smooth ascent to the heavens. Looking out the window, he watches the clouds pass over the wing like wisps of smoke until a sudden glare of the sun makes him turn away. The lower pressure of high altitude also makes his head hurt worse and he sees another white flash. But this flash is different this time, somehow more tangible. As if a memory is trying to claw its way out of the glare and suddenly Peter sees himself standing at a loading dock watching crates being loaded onto a ship. He's aware that he's holding a machine gun, and there are others with him, also holding machine guns. The flash passes as quickly as it began, and Peter is left once again wondering. Well, that's all for now, folks, but I'll be back again next Friday with another story, just for you. Until then, sleep well.